Cave exploring, or more commonly referred to as caving or spelunking, is the recreational pastime of exploring wild cave systems with challenges and obstacles varying from location to location. Caving is often done for the enjoyment of the outdoor activity, as well as for the purposes of original exploration. Virgin cave systems comprise some of the last unexplored regions on Earth and much effort is put into trying to locate, enter, and survey these undiscovered territories. In well-traveled regions, the most accessible caves have already been explored and gaining access to new cave systems often requires cave digging or cave diving and vast experience with cave exploration and or rock climbing. The three general rules of any cave exploration expedition is to take nothing but pictures, kill nothing but time, and leave nothing nothing but footprints. Caving is also described as an individualist team sport as cavers can often make a trip without direct physical assistance from others but will generally go in a group for companionship or to provide help during times of emergency. This is why having at least four people in your group is so important. If someone is hurt or stuck, one person should stay with the injured party while the other two return to get help. And make sure your cave team has a first aid kit, extra food and water for the people staying behind, as well as the people going for help. Even when these well-intended principles and rules are followed, many difficulties and obstacles can and will unexpectedly arise during a caver's explorations. These difficulties may include, but are not limited to, absence of natural sunlight beyond the cave's entrance, tight squeezes, water hazards, disorientation, falling objects, rainy weather, flooding, dead ends, unstable grounding, humidity levels, soft spots, echoing, hypothermia, paranoia, claustrophobia, and various other unforeseeable hazards that classify caving as an extreme sport. Though not commonly considered as such by longtime enthusiasts, many of these precautions are enforced due to prior cavers' experiences that ended in near-fatal circumstances. The most notorious and recent cautionary tale is that of John Edward Jones. John Edward Jones loved cave exploring with his family as a boy and teenager. His father frequently took him and his brother Josh on caving expeditions in Utah when they were children. The boys learned to love the underground world of dark mystery that not many ever get to witness in their lifetime. John's most recent destination of interest was Nutty Putty Cave, located west of Utah Lake in Utah County, Utah. The cave had been first developed in the 1960s by Dale Green and was temporarily closed in 2004 after a near-fatal incident with two Boy Scouts. The two Boy Scouts had nearly lost their lives in separate incidences in the same area of Nutty Putty Cave where John would soon meet his untimely demise. The two Boy Scouts had become trapped within a week of each other and in one of the cases, rescue workers took 14 hours to free a 16-year-old scout, making him much smaller than the 6-foot, 200-pound John Jones. The cave had only been reopened for six months in 2009 when John and 10 other friends and family members decided to enter the cave during Thanksgiving week in 2009. The excursion, organized by John's brother Josh, would be John's first and last expedition into the cave system as an adult male. November 24th, 8 p.m. According to various news articles cited in the description of this video, the timelines of events are as follows. At around 8 p.m., John Edward Jones entered Nutty Putty Cave local time on the evening of Tuesday, November 24th, 2009, just a few days before Thanksgiving. John, 26 at the time, and Josh, 23, along with nine other friends and family members, decided to explore Nutty Putty Cave as a way to connect with each other ahead of the holiday weekend. At age 26, John was happily married, had a one-year-old daughter, and was expecting another child the following year and was attending medical school in Virginia. He had come back home to Utah to spend some relaxing holiday time with his family. It had been years since John was in any cave system and now weighing in at around 200 pounds and over 6 foot 1, he wasn't the flexible young boy he used to be. November 24th, 9pm. About an hour into the cave expedition, John decided to find the Nutty Putty Cave Formation known as the Birth Canal, a tight passage that spelunkers must crawl through extremely carefully to avoid possibly fatal consequences. He mistakenly found what he thought was the birth canal but in actuality was the Ed push section of the cave. He inched his way into the narrow passage head first, moving forward using his hips, stomach, and fingers. But within minutes, he'd realized he'd made a grave mistake. John knew he didn't have enough room to wiggle back out of the way he'd come in. He had to press forward. He tried to exhale the air in his chest so that he could fit through a space that was barely 10 inches across and 10 inches high, about the size of the opening of a closed dryer. But when John inhaled again and his chest puffed back out, he got stuck for good. John's brother was the first to find him. Josh tried to pull at his brother's calves to no avail. 
Then John accidentally slid down into the passage even further, becoming trapped worse than before. His arms were now pinned beneath his chest and he couldn't move whatsoever. All John and Josh could do at this point was pray. They both knew they needed search and rescue teams. So Josh crawled back up to the surface and called 911 while a friend went to the tunnel to stay with John. In this exclusive excerpt from one of Josh's friends attending the exploration, we were able to see a first-hand account of what took place before John's fatal decision. Emily says, We had a map of the cave and got to the part where we couldn't find where it continued. So we each took a route that looked like it could be the right way. It is this part of the story that I keep recalling over and over in my head because at this point I asked John if he wanted to explore the spot, which we later would learn is called the Ed's Push area. He went into the spot face first because he was climbing up, and then it curved and started heading downwards. Then it got too small for him to push himself back upwards against gravity, so he slid further down in the hole and became wedged. We didn't know he was stuck for several minutes. Jessica and I waited for Josh to get out of the hole he was exploring. When he did, we told him, without much thought, to go in and see if John needed help. Meanwhile, Jessica and I explored two other spots where the cave could have continued. The rest of the group joined us at this point. We could not find where it continued, so sat waiting near the area. After about 15 minutes, I hollered to Josh if things were okay. He came out in a mix of calm and panic and said he was going to go up and call for help and ask that I go in to comfort John and maybe try to help. I was the only adult that would fit into the space, so I crawled in after John and I tried several things to move him upward. But even once help arrived, John was still trapped 400 feet into the cave and 100 feet below the Earth's surface. Getting people, equipment, and supplies that far down would take at least an hour. Rescuers believe John sucked in his chest to investigate the canal, sliding his torso over a piece of rock and down into the 10 inch wide side of the crevice. But when his chest expanded again, he was stuck. Struggling to free himself only made John slide deeper into a narrower 8.5 inch wide side of the canal opening. One arm was pinned underneath him, the other forced backward by an outcropping of rock. The canal opening became narrower and more compacted the further down he slid by means of struggle. This meant the more John wiggled, the faster his chest would be slowly obstructed by the canal's concave opening. This made John's breathing difficult due to his positioning in the canal's crevice. The human body is designed to be upright and the heart works with the force of gravity, not against it. When rescuers told trauma on-site physician Doug Murdoch that John was nearly upside down, he knew the trapped man didn't have much time. Being upside down, your body has to pump the blood out of the brain at all times. Your body isn't set up to do that. The entire system begins to fail. Murdoch headed for the scene, knowing blood and fluids would be pulling in John's brain and lungs. His circulation would be slowing, capillaries leaking, toxins building up in his blood. If the rescuers were to free John, those toxins could rush to his heart and kill him. There are very few studies about the long-term effects of being upside down, but Murdoch thought John might have 8 to 10 hours left to live. November 25th, 12.30 a.m. The first rescuer to reach John was a woman named Susie Motola who arrived at about 12.30 a.m. on November 25th, 2009. Susie met two other rescuers and descended into the cave through a rocky hole on top of a large hill in the West Desert. They traversed his chambers for about 30 minutes before reaching the 135-foot tunnel where John was stuck. At that point, John had been trapped for around three and a half hours. Crawling on her belly, Susie Mutola inched her way through a cramped limestone tunnel. The search and rescue team volunteers sweated in 70-degree heat and stifling humidity, clothes covered in soft brown clay. This unmapped passage of Utah County's Nutty Puff Cave system was no wider than the opening of a washing machine, and Susie had ropes tied around her ankles so other rescuers could pull her out if she accidentally got stuck. November 25th, 1 a.m. 20 minutes passed before the beam of her headlamp fell upon a pair of navy and black running shoes sticking out of narrow crevice at the tunnel's end. It was John Jones. Susie attempted to communicate with John and greeted him with, Hi John, my name is Susie. How's it going? His replies seemed to come from the other end of a long hallway. Hi Susie, thanks for coming, but I really, really want to get out said the 26-year-old John Jones. He was trapped nearly upside down, his six-foot, 200-pound body externally swallowed by the rock. Above John, Susie's slight, five-foot, three-inch frame was also encased. She couldn't fully extend her arms and legs, but she was confident she could help John. Among the smallest of the dedicated band of search and rescue volunteers in Utah County, Susie couldn't carry the biggest packs, but she was a caver and wasn't intimidated by 
the narrow tunnels in the Nutty Putty cave system. John had been stuck for more than three hours, one arm bent underneath his chest, the other forced backwards. His calves were free but useless. Susie tied a web rope into a lover's knot around his ankles. She realized bringing John out of the cave was going to be like swimming backwards against a very strong current. Inside the tunnel, Susie tried everything she could think of to free John. She stretched a water bottle down to his right arm so she could tip the bottle forward. The water flowed down his arm and Susie hoped some of it might reach his mouth. She helped string a rope from John's back to the rest of the team in an open pit at the tunnel's entrance. The team pulled but didn't have enough power to move John. The friction of the rope rubbing against the stone was too strong. Susie helped him shift positions but she couldn't lift him. After about two hours of attempting, Susie had tried everything she knew and crawled out for rest while another rescuer took her place. November 25th, 2.30 AM. The search and rescue team worked to solve the friction problem by rigging a pulley system anchored to the tunnel's walls with a series of climbing anchors that are designed to fit quickly and tightly into rock and clay. They had to push the anchors through a thick layer of powdery calcite that coated the cave walls, then string the rope through the attached pulley, creating a hook, pull, and rope system to reach John's body vertically downward. After each new section of calcite, they tried the system again. More than 100 rescue personnel worked feverishly to free John. Utah County Sheriff Lieutenant Tom Hodgins knew about the damaging effects of what this particular cave could do. Hodgins was there six years ago when a 16-year-old boy got stuck in the same tunnel that trapped John. It took crew members 14 hours to free the boy and the teen spent three days in the hospital afterwards. When a second person got stuck at Nutty Putty less than a week later, state officials closed the cave back in 2006. Sean Roundy, one of the rescue workers on the scene, explained the difficulties of exploring Nutty Putty Cave. Most of the passages were dangerous narrow even at the entrance where warning signs had been placed and now with John trapped inside the cave time was running out the downward angle at which John was trapped was putting great stress on his body because such a position requires the heart to work incredibly hard to continuously pump blood out of the brain when the body is right side up gravity does the work without causing additional strain on the heart rescuers tied John with a rope connected to a series of pulleys everything was ready and they pulled as hard as they could but suddenly and without warning, one of the pulleys failed. Roundy believes that the pulley came loose at its anchor point in the cave wall, which contained a substantial amount of loose clay. The team pulled and pulled again, but John's feet kept hitting the tunnel's low ceiling. With his heart struggling to pump blood into his legs, the contact against the cave made him scream in pain. The rescuers came to a horrible realization. The angle of the tunnel meant they couldn't bend John's body backwards without likely breaking his legs. In his weakened state, the shock could kill him, and the cams anchoring the pulleys were already slipping from their position in the weak, calcite cavernous walls. It was all incredibly tedious and each trip into the tunnel to pass a piece of gear took nearly an hour. The Utah County Sheriff's Office set up a command center with rescue leaders plotting and attempting idea after idea. With no back entrance into the cave, rescuers were quickly running out of time and options. Rescuers ordered six gallons of cooking oil with the hope of helping John slip out of the canal. They even considered explosives, but quickly determined neither idea would be time effective. Drills and chisels continued to arrive throughout the day, but the larger equipment was too big to position near John. The smaller equipment was too slow for this specific rescue mission. When they tried to widen the rocky corkscrew to prepare for John's exit, it took an hour and a half to drill through a mere six inches of rock. Their original pulley system using climbing cans was by far their most promising method for saving John's life. The anchors couldn't get a strong grip in the layer of powdery calcite that coated the cave's walls. A search and rescue team member named Ryan Schertz would stay with John during the reconstruction effort on the pulley system. When the new system was finished, the team would inch John up from the rope tied around his legs. Ryan would attempt to facilitate the efforts by shifting John from the eight and a half wide side of the crevice to the slightly wider side of the fissure. Next, the crew would pull as hard as they could to extract John and had medicine ready to give John intravenously immediately after they freed him. When Ryan reached John, he loosened the knot Susie had tied around his legs previously. He brought a water pouch filled with Gatorade and stretched the attached tube down to John so he could drink. He rubbed John's leg to remind him he wasn't in the hole alone. John oscillated between calm, coherent conversation to helplessly thrashing his legs in sheer pain. 
November 25th, 4 p.m. When the pulley system was finished around 4 p.m. on November 25th, John had been trapped for almost 19 hours, but rescuers had finally had the power to pull him out. The rope was strung through nearly 15 tandem pulleys drilled into the wall of the cave. Closest to John, the rope went through a natural arch in the wall just above the crack where he was trapped. Ryan tried to prepare John for what was about to happen. Ryan said, Okay, John, I need your help. I need you to make sure you're pushing with your hands. I'm going to push you towards the wide side of the fissure. Eight people above worked on the pulley system to attempt to have John's body lifted out of the crevice. With each tug, he moved a little further. Then his feet hit the low ceiling and John screamed in pain. Ryan yelled for the teams to lower him to give him a rest. When they lifted John up for the third time, Ryan stuck his hand in the crack to give John his first glimpse of another person in hours. John's face was muddied and his eyes were red from crying, but he wasn't bleeding and his eyes were a bright, vibrant brown. After about 20 minutes, Ryan raised his voice to yell at the crew to resume their efforts. The rope moved again and John inched upward. Ryan began to have hope that the attempt would be successful. Against the sheer impossibility of it all, John Jones might get out alive to reunite with his family. Then a blast of pain overcame Ryan's face coming from the pulley system. When he came to, blood was everywhere. His jaw felt broken, his eye was swelling. Under the pressure of John's body and the crew pulling from above, the stone arch being used for friction had shattered, and the rope tied around it snapped in two, violently shooting a heavy metal carabiner directly straight at Ryan's face. Ryan tried to speak as reassuringly as he could with a tongue sliced nearly in half. Back at the pit, the eight people pulling the rope crashed to the ground when it was slacked. The task was becoming more and more seemingly impossible. Ryan's father, Dave Schertz, who was also working the rescue line, saw Ryan's face covered in blood. He worried his son might have a concussion, a cracked skull, or had even lost an eye. As paramedics assessed the extent of the damage, Ryan told his father it was okay to go back into the tunnel. Someone had to stay with John. Dave reluctantly crawled in. While he waited for a drill to make a new pulley hole, Dave tried to wrap a rope around John's wrist. He lowered himself into the wider end of the crack, but it was too tight to work the rope all the way around John. He asked John to suck his stomach in, but he didn't respond. Then it was Dave who was stuck. It took him 15 minutes to crawl out of the crack. When he got the drill, Dave stood in the crack next to John, pointed up, drilling madly, struggling in the damp, humid conditions. He tried to pull the pulley in and found the hole was too small. He drilled the second hole and pushed the pulley through there. He was exhausted. At returning to the surface, Dave pulled Utah County Sheriff Lieutenant Tom Hodgins aside and said, John's dying right now. He has a heartbeat, but he's had difficulty breathing before I got there. November 25th, 11.56 p.m. With no hope of rescue and his heart having suffered hours upon hours of strain due to his upside down position, John Jones never woke up or responded to any more contact attempts. At 11.56 on November 25, 2009, a paramedic crawled into the cave and pronounced John Jones dead. John's cause of death was cardiac arrest shortly before midnight on the evening of November 25th. Rescuers had spent a total of more than 27 hours trying to save John. His family thanked rescuers for their help despite the horrible news. Removing John's body after his death would be even harder than it was when he was alive. Just six volunteers had been able to crawl through the tunnel to reach John out of a total of 137 rescuers who responded. Although a difficult decision, both the Jones family and the Utah Police Department came to a mutual agreement and understanding. The cave would remain John Jones' final resting place as they didn't want to put more search and rescue workers' lives in jeopardy. In 2016, filmmaker Isaac Palasima produced and directed a full-length feature film about the life and failed rescue of John Jones called The Last Descent. The film gives you a theatrical account of the final hours of John's life and is available to watch on Amazon.com. Although the events might not be the most factually accurate, the movie does give an emotional perspective on how John spent his final hours in Nutty Putty Cave. The link to the film and the references I used for this video will be in the description box below. Ten years have passed since John's death and his former wife Emily has since remarried. As of 2014, Emily has relocated her family of two children to Dallas, Texas where she happily resides. She continues to remain in contact with John's family and attends the Jones' annual family reunion. Emily also welcomed a third baby child into the world with her now husband Donovan. Both Lizzie and John were happy to welcome their new baby brother Emerson into their growing family. Officials closed off Naughty Putty Cave permanently a week after John's death. Crew members sealed off the cave's main and only entrance with concrete to give the family peace of mind and to further prevent accidents and fatalities. They never recovered John's body, which remains inside the 1,400 feet of cavernous chutes and mysterious dark tunnels to this very day. At the time of filming this video, 
John Edward Jones would have been 36 years old. And we